That was great. Yes, it was great, wasn't it? Thank you. You know, I love when you sing about Jesus returning. When Jesus returns, everybody in the whole world will be happy. Everybody? Everybody. Why will everyone be so happy? Because Jesus is going to fix everything that's bad. People won't be sick anymore. People won't be mean to each other anymore. People won't be hungry anymore. Wow, I can't wait. Yes, it's going to be wonderful. Hey, what's this for sale sign for? Why is Buckaroo Bob selling his house? Oh, I don't know. You know Buckaroo is always doing something silly. Well, why don't we call him out here to find out what he's up to? Susie Q, would you please see if you can call him out here? Buckaroo, Buckaroo. I think we're going to have to call him a lot louder if he's going to hear us. Maybe all the other kids on the internet can help us do this. Well, everyone say it with me. Let's do it on a count of three. One, two, three. Buckaroo! What? What? Who's calling? Hey, hey, it's all my friends from Tyler, Texas, and on the internet. <laughs> Buckaroo, I want to know what you've got there. Miss Nancy, can, can I ask everyone to tell all their friends and family and cousins and aunts and grandmas and nephews and uncles? Tell them and... what? Tell them what? Oh, uh, uh, tell them that they can watch us every Friday night at 7.30 Central Time as part of Bring on the Sabbath at CGI.org. <laughs> yes, and they can also watch it on the Roku channel for CGI. Yeah, and Miss Nancy, tell them that if they watch, they got to give us a shout out. Why, why should everybody just write to Mr. Jeff and Mr. Wes and Miss Nancy? We want some shout outs. Yeah, they should call us too. We're stars too. Okay, just calm down and let's move on. Now, Buckaroo, what do you have there? That's my knapsack. You know, I'm selling my house, and I'm moving away. We can see the for sale sign, but why are you moving away? And what do you have in that knapsack? Let's, let's have a look at it. Can, I, can you give it to me here? Well, you see, I, um... Uh, oh, Buckaroo, uh, let Miss Nancy look at that knapsack. Oh, oh uh, well. We have, Houston, we have a problem. Oh, well. Let me, I'm trying to get this knapsack open to see what's inside. Oh, well, uh, uh -huh. maybe, maybe you don't uh -huh. need to look. It's Let's see. You got, you got a little lunch right yeah, here. Yeah, that's my right lunch there. for when I get hungry. Oh, okay. he's got an apple. I love apples. Can I have a bite? Um, no, maybe later. Okay, and so uh, what else have we got in here? Um, here is your little camera. Oh, nope, here's a rubber ducky. How about yeah, that? that? Yeah, my rubber ducky. That's right for there. when I take a bath. I always take a bath with my rubber ducky. <laughs> Buckery, you better take a bath or you'll smell like a muddy puppy. Well, and here's your camera. I guess you're going to be taking some pictures after you move? Oh, oh, take a picture of me. Here's my good side. Hmm. Here, maybe, take my picture. Yeah, maybe later. Let me put that up here and see there's one more thing in here. Get this out. This is your paint and brush set. Yeah, Look I love the paint. That. Yeah, uh, I love the paint. You know, I'm an artist. Uh, Buckaroo, there's not much food in here. Uh, I think this stuff is only going to last you for about a day. Uh, only a day? Well, that's right. Then I better go pack some more stuff. I'll wait, be right wait, back. wait, oh, Buckaroo. We leave. want to know why you want to move away. I have to. I've got to move a mile away from here. Buckaroo, don't you like living next door to me? Oh, yeah, I love living next door to you, Suze Q. You're my best friend. We do a lot of stuff together. I'm going to miss riding bikes with you and going down to the park and buying stuff from the Popsicle Man in the summer. Well, I live across the street. Don't you like living across the street from me? Oh, oh I love living across the street from you, Miss Nancy. You're always making us cookies, and you give us rides to Walmart. Well, are you in trouble in school or something? No, no. I like my teacher. I, I like all the kids in our class. Is there someone around here you don't like? Is that mean kid Butch picking on you again? Oh, no, no. Nothing like that. I, and I like all our neighbors. Mrs. Foster with all the cats and Miss Betsy with all those goofy stacks of rocks in her yard. Bucker, would you please focus? Oh, yes. Um, I even like Grumpy Dr. Nelson who yells at us when the ball goes in his yard. I, I like everybody in our neighborhood. I just need to move somewhere a mile away. Oh, what? Well, Yankee Dan told me that most accidents happen within a mile of your home. Mm. So in order to be safe, I need to move to a new house a mile away from where I live. Oh, Bucker, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And you say Yankee Dan told you that? Yeah, he sure did. Let me call him up here. Hey, hey, Yan, Dan, come on, come on up here. 
Yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you guys want? Yes. What are you going to get it right? Can all you kids say it with me? It's, it's not yous, it's y'all. Yeah, 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 whatever. You know up north they say it right, girly. So you better start saying yous because the north was settled before the south. So we know how to talk better up uh, here. Yankee Dan, let's, let's drop that for now. Huh. I want to know if you told Buckaroo Bob that most accidents happen within a mile of your home. Absolutely, that's a fact. Miss Nancy, didn't you know that? Well, it's true. Most accidents do happen within a mile of your home. Well, see, and Yankee Dan is going to sell me a house a mile from here. What? Yankee Dan, are you a realtor? Uh, well, in some states. <laughs> and he's only going to charge me a 20% real estate fee. 20%? Most realtors only charge 6%. This is getting out of hand. So, so Miss Nancy, you, you do agree, though, that I do need to move a mile away, well, right? Well, no, you, because you see... No, no Miss Nancy, please tell Buckaroo not to move. I know, and I will, and I have to... I know to... I really would miss him. He sometimes gets on my nerves, but I still like him. Yes, I know, and Buckaroo... And even though he doesn't, doesn't want to play dolls with me, and even though his room is always a mess, and even though he drinks way too much root beer and burps, I still want him to stay and live next door to me for years and years and years, all the way until he goes to college. College? He'll be lucky to get into a trade school. What? Uh, I... You're getting off the subject, and that girl over there is making my head hurt. Oh, right. Now, Buckaroo, moving is not going to solve your problem. Pay attention, because when you move, you'll be in your new home. And in your new home, you won't be a mile away from home anymore. Oh, re really? Is, is that right, Dan? Well, uh, you see... Uh... Of course Miss Nancy's right, Buckaroo! Well, then I guess I better not move. Uh, but what about my realtor fee? Oh, Yankee Dan, I'm going to come up there and... Calm down, Susie Q. Uh... Stay right where you are. Buckaroo, we'll talk about this more later. In the meantime, let's talk about being afraid. Are you ever afraid, Susie Q? Well, not really. My friend George is afraid of clowns. Yeah, me too, yeah. Well, most people are afraid of something. What are some things that might make uh, you scared or might scare you? How about spiders? Hmm. How about uh, snakes? Earthquakes? Tornadoes? Oh, my best friend Marcy's afraid of the dark. She always sleeps with the light on in her closet. Yes, sometimes the dark is scary. You, you never know what's out there. Boo! Ah! Susie Q, was that nice? I think you owe Buckaroo an apology. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it would scare you so much. I was just trying to be funny. Well, it's okay. I wasn't really scared. I was just playing along. Okay, well, let's get back to our subject. What can we do to keep from being afraid? Where do we get protection from? Uh, this, from the things in life that make us afraid. Well, our parents protect us. That's right. Do, we, do you have any other ideas? Uh, policemen protect us. Yeah, what about firemen? They protect us. Our teachers protect us too. Well, these are good examples, but our best protection comes from God. He's with us to protect us even when we're, there's not a parent or teacher or police officer around. Miss Nancy, do you know who protects me? Tell me who. Ralph and Eddie. Are those the two big guys at school? Did you give them your lunch money for protection? Nope. Ralph and Eddie are my two vicious guard dogs. Dogs? Are they around here now? Sure. Miss Nancy, I think they're over there by Susie Q's window. <laughs> by my window? Miss Nancy, will, will you bring them out so all the other kids on the internet can see my big guard dogs? Is that a good idea? Are, are you scared, Susie Q? Uh, no. All right, I see. Here they are. Oh, they're just stuffed animals. <laughs> That's true. Buckaroo, um, this one's a lion. What? Who? Ralph? Ralph? You tell me Ralph's a lion. How do you know he's a lion? Look at his mane here. Oh, I thought he just had wild nose hairs. Miss Nancy, seeing Ralph reminds me of the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Do you know that story? Yes, I love that story. And I know it too. It's about how Daniel got into trouble because he obeyed God. Yes, yes, and some bad people wanted Daniel to disobey God and got mad at him. 
So a bad king threw Daniel into a lion's den. Right, and then what happened? Well, the lions were hungry, and they were going to eat Daniel, but God shut their mouths, and the lions couldn't open their mouths, and they couldn't eat Daniel. That's right. God protected Daniel. Lots of times, God protects us, and we don't even know it. He puts a hedge of protection around us. A hedge? What's a hedge? A hedge is like a big fence made out of bushes. That's correct. We don't see the hedge of protection God places around us, but God's army of angels is always around us, keeping us safe. You know, there's another example of a hedge around God's people. It has to do with Elisha. Do you kids know who Elisha is? I don't know any kid named Elisha. Is he in our school? Well, I think he was a prophet in the Bible, and some bad king was mad at him. That's right. It wasn't the same bad king that was mad at Daniel. This was a different bad king. And this bad king sent an army to arrest Elisha. And Elisha's friend was real scared. But Elisha told his friend not to worry, and Elisha said a special prayer. Well, what did he pray for? He asked God to open his friend's eyes to see what was out there. What, what do you mean out there? What was out there? A great big army of angels that was there to protect Elisha and his friend. Elisha could see the angels, but his friend couldn't. Wow, did God open the friend's eyes? He sure did. God made the friend able to see the huge army of angels that was going to protect him and Elisha from the bad king's army, so they weren't afraid anymore. Whoa, this is so cool! Then we shouldn't be afraid either? That's right. We should remember what Elisha told his friends. Don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Or we could say it this way, if God is on our side, we are stronger than anyone or anything that we might be afraid of. How about if we make this our lesson for today? God is on my side, so I am not afraid. Can I get you guys to say it with me? We're going to say, God is on my side, so I am not afraid. Let's do it together on a count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. God, God is, is on, on my, my side, side, so, so I, I am, am not, not afraid. afraid. Good job. I hope you on the internet said it with us too. Maybe you can remind yourself of that whenever you feel afraid. Well, I'm sure going to remember that from now on, Miss Nancy. <laughs> me too. Yeah, and maybe I'll remember it too. Well, that's good. Miss Nancy, I got to go now. I got to go visit my grandma and my grandpa because I love to go visit my grandma and grandpa. And whenever I go to their house, I always give them a big hug and a big kiss. And, and whenever you kids out there go visit your grandparents, I hope you remember to always give them a big hug and a big kiss. Well, I got to go right now. But before I go, remember what I always say sometimes. I always say sometimes, have a good Sabbath. Can you say that with me on the count of three? One, good. two, three. Have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Wow. Well, we're almost done, but first a word from our announcer. Take it away, Dan. Okay. Uh, Buckaroo Bob has been filmed before a live studio audience, you guys. It's not you. It's y'all. Oh, I'm going to wait for Yankee Dan in the parking lot. But first, live from Tyler, Texas, it's Bring On the Sabbath! Bring On the Sabbath, a production of the Church of God International. Broadcast live from Tyler, Texas. Featuring Wes White, Nancy White, Jeff Reed, and the cast of Buckaroo Bob's Neighborhood. Now here is your host, Wes White. Good evening and welcome to our 13th Bring on the Sabbath. Thank you for starting off your Sabbath with us this evening. We hope you find our show to be both entertaining and edifying. Today is a special day. Facebook is now officially 12 years old. And, and I know y'all like Facebook, but let's be honest. Facebook kind of ruined birthdays because before Facebook, when somebody said happy, bir happy birthday, it actually meant something. Now, I know a lot of church people are into healthy eating and they like to do the non-organic thing and the non-GMO thing. Well, you know, Chipotle's recent E. coli outbreak was linked to the usage of fresh ingredients. And after they figured this out, a spokesman for Taco Bell said, hey, we're safe. Now in this show, 
we have to talk about the news tonight. There's so much going on. We're in the midst of the presidential primary season. And you know that I don't vote, but I like to keep up with things. And I know some of you out there are interested in current events. So here at BOTS, we have contacted the campaign headquarters of all the remaining presidential candidates. And I think there are like, what, seven candidates left over now in the two parties? Well, we've written all seven of them, and we have given each one of them an invitation to come onto this show to be interviewed by us. Wouldn't that be interesting? And if any one of them shows up, just to make sure that he feels comfortable during the interview, we also have five other guys who will interrupt him every time he tries to talk. When I watch the debates, I say, would you let the guy just finish one sentence? Now, we've already had the Iowa caucuses. We've already had the New Hampshire primary. And today, they're all concerned about South Carolina and Nevada. And this is the time when presidential candidates who aren't really religious, they pretend that they're religious. And they're not fooling anybody. Here's an example. One of the candidates, and I'm not going to mention his name, but one of the candidates went to a church service last Sunday in South Carolina. And it's, it's so obvious that he doesn't go to church very much because later on he commented, he said, I really like the part where they passed me that basket of free money. There was yet another debate last week between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, another one. These two sound like an old married couple. They, they've already had so many debates. I think they're starting to run out of things to fight about. And during the last debate, Bernie Sanders got the most speaking time as well as the most speaking volume. I mean, when Bernie Sanders talks, he always sounds like your grandfather when he's got a bad connection on his old rotary telephone. And in the debate, one of the questions to Hillary Clinton was this. They asked her, they said, who is your favorite president? And she said, well, with apologies to President Obama, with apologies to my husband, Bill, my favorite president is Abraham Lincoln. And then Bernie Sanders shot back, he said, Senator, I knew Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was a friend of mine, and you, ma'am, are no Abraham Lincoln. And if you don't know who Dan Quayle is, you have no idea who I'm talking about here. All right. I don't understand, I gotta be honest, I don't understand what this feel the burn thing is all about, but Bernie has a lot more young supporters than Hillary does. I mean, Bernie's like, what, 70, some 76 years old? Even at the hipster tattoo shops, shops where the young people hang out, these kids are Bernie supporters. A lot of these hipster tattoo shops are now offering a free tattoo of Bernie Sanders, or as they're calling it, a grant stamp. We got a great show for you tonight. We're gonna to talk about Supreme Court vacancies. We're gonna start our series on attracting and keeping young people in the church. So don't go away, stick around. We'll be right back. Women are under a lot of pressure these days. For many women, having it all means doing it all. We wear many hats, wife, mother, sister, daughter, employee, boss, chauffeur, cook, neighbor, friend, and child of God, continually juggling roles and workloads. Do you feel like your spiritual life is being squeezed out? Could you use a break from day to day so you can focus on what is eternal? We want to offer Christian women an opportunity to be refreshed at our women's retreat in Lindale, Texas on Saturday and Sunday, April 9th and 10th. This is a joint activity sponsored by both Christian Educational Ministries and the Church of God International. This event is open to all women, not just women of our faith. Please check out our website, newchurchlady.org, and see what this woman's retreat is all about. You can read the New Church Lady blog and find information about the conference schedule, location, housing, and how to register. We think you are going to find the cost of attending this event is very reasonable. Give yourself a break from all the stress of being a Christian woman in today's world. Let's spend a weekend together in Christian love so we can be renewed in our faith. Again, that's newchurchlady.org. We're back. We're glad you're here. Nancy, who do we have in the chat room tonight? Well, we have Mimi, Grover's friend, Joy, Carl, beautiful jury, Calgary, 
James, Super Jim, Jeff, John Black, Lady Tex, Kevin Joe, Rob, and Pat from West Virginia. What about Kathy the cop? Is she out there? Oh, look at that. Okay. That's for Jeff's uh, mom. She has not checked in yet. But I do want to mention something serious. Uh, we've been asked to pray for Fiji, and I know a lot of people have been praying yeah. for Fiji. Yes. Uh, Rome is, our friend Rome is there. Um, it's Cyclone Winston is supposed to be the largest recorded storm in history, and it's headed there. Wow. Right? My. Okay, powerful. so let's pray for uh, Fiji. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I know Kevin's out there. I just got an email from him. He says... Uh, uh, he fulfilled the, the uh, assignment for the difference between being in the world and of the world. And here's what he says. He says, we have no choice when it comes to being in the world, but to be of it is to be part of Satan's system. He said, taking part in Halloween, Christmas, Easter, putting worldly things first in your life in place of the things God would want us to focus on or preparing for the kingdom of God. And uh, he's going to look into the uh, young people, keeping them involved in the church. Good. All right, great. Good. Well, it's good to have uh, people who do their homework. Yes. Thank you so much, Kevin <laughs> O'Hare from Hessville. And I'm going to see Kevin in, what, less than two weeks? We're going to baptize him. I think it's two weeks from two tomorrow. Weeks. tomorrow. Yes, That's I'm amazingly great. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. So yeah. Kevin, Kevin. We'll see. All right. I've never met Kevin before. He's from my hometown of Hessville, Indiana. And are you going to go get House of Pizza We're going to eat House of Pizza Pizza, I guarantee it. I knew that. You can, yeah. two things in this world, you can, well, three, right? Death, yeah. taxes, and Wes going to House of Pizza. There, you were you know. telling us earlier before the show that that's the only phone number you remembered for like your whole life or something? Or well, you think that? it might be a girlfriend or maybe yeah. his own phone number. Yeah, phone yeah. Number. yeah, House of Pizza Pizza is so good. I remember the number, 844-6065. And I've remembered it since 1955. And just answer the question, no, Carl, it's not deep dish. Oh, they do have thick crust. They do. I don't know if they have deep dish, but they do have thick crust. Not like Chicago. Probably. Not like Chicago. Okay. All right, we're in our Alpha and Omega current events. Don't forget to talk to us in the chat room. Send us an email, wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. We want to hear from you. Now, I'm going to throw a last-minute curveball at Jeff and Nancy this evening. This is... Totally spontaneous. All right. None of this is planned. I recently got an email from a friend of mine. His name is Bernard. He's in North Carolina, and right. I want to read it real quick. We don't have time to discuss it in great detail tonight. As usual, we got way too much material for this show. But I think that what Bernard sends us is something that we want to examine in detail in future shows. Let me know what you think. Bernard sent me a link to the Stars and Stripes magazine. If you don't know what that is, Stars and Stripes is a magazine. It's published for American soldiers and, and sailors. Right. The title of the article is House Bill Requires Women to Sign Up for the Draft. Now, this is a bill, not a law that's been passed. Okay. It's, it's a only proposed bill. It's only an house. Only okay. All right, Washington. It says, yeah. and I'm going to read it. It says, two House Republicans introduced a bill Thursday requiring eligible women in the United States to sign up for the military draft just days after it was recommended by the Marine Corps and the Army. So these two guys didn't just dream this up. So, it was requested by the Pentagon that they really? do this. The two guys are Representative Duncan Hunter, Republican from California. He's a Marine veteran. Mm -hmm. And Representative uh, Ryan Zinke, Republican from uh, Montana. He is a retired Navy SEAL. And they filed the uh, this uh, bill. It's called the Draft America's Daughter Act. Uh, it's, it would be a historic move to fully integrate female troops into all yeah. combat roles. Mm -hmm. If this law is passed, and that's a big if, right. and we can't predict the future on this yeah. show. It seems very we? progressive for Republicans. Very, very yeah, progressive. But if passed, the article says, women from 18 years old to 26 years old would be, the, for the first time, would have to join men in registering with the Selective Service Program and potentially be forced to fight in future wars. That's the end of the article. Now I want to read what Bernard says about this, because hmm. Bernard has some salient points here. He says, quote, I would suggest that the churches of God need to get out in front of this issue, Amen, yeah. starting with a total end-to-end -end review of their doctrinal position on military service and war, mm -hmm. and then moving on to develop new materials to help young members to understand why they must decline to participate in going to war. Still quoting from Bernard. He said, we must do this before our nation decides to resume forcing young adults into military service. He says, when war breaks out, events might move fast, uh, far faster than any church of God can respond, and certainly faster than members can study and evaluate the doctrine 
and then properly document their beliefs and be on record as to their qualification for an exemption. End quote from Bernard. Yeah, you got to get ready in advance. You got to be in front of this. I yeah. think Bernard is absolutely right in what he says. And I hope that all of our ministers in the church, of God, who are out there, these ministers who like to watch all the TV news shows so that they can promote their views on prophecy, I hope they're also looking at this issue from the point of view of how we can help our young people in the church. Right. But we'll see if that happens. All right. I had to, we'll talk about it more later, but I had to go through this with my two sons and register them when they were 18. And yeah. I have a daughter, you know, I didn't have to register her. So right. uh, it's, it's something a parent needs to be concerned about. And yeah. you're right. The kids need help. There is documentation that you and I went through to, yes, help, we did. to help out. And we'll talk about that more later. Okay. But yeah, definitely these materials need to now, be made available. Now, I wasn't even going to bring this up tonight, but the presidential candidates are now discussing this issue oh, in really? the debates. In a recent debate, I think it was in New Hampshire, I believe it was an ABC News moderator who asked the candidates if young women should be required to sign up for selective service. Mm -hmm. As I remember, and somebody correct me if I've got this wrong, if I remember, it was three candidates, Rubio, Christie, and Bush, all answered that women registering for the draft is some kind of a quote-unquote right. Mm -hmm. That's the way they phrased right. it. They used okay. the term. Okay. Mm -hmm. Further, Jeb Bush also made this statement, and I'm, I think this is a quote. The draft is not going to be reinstituted, and I think I'm quoting it accurately. So that's why you register for something that's never going to happen. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and, and it, yeah, exactly. So I asked the question, if this is really, really true, then why don't we just call the whole thing off and just do away with registration? Not register anybody. Yeah. But, and I think everybody who understands the way the government works knows the answer to the question about why they won't get rid of it. Further, I think this whole discussion we're having falls under the category of be careful what you ask for because you might get it. Sure, this equality has been a big, yeah. very big important drive. issue. Be yeah. careful what you ask for because you might get it. And I say this for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the two reasons. First, the women's liberation people have wanted complete equal rights for women for decades. And once again, I am not in that debate. I'm not taking a side on this. I'm just reporting what's been going on for decades. This bill, if it becomes law, and it's not a law, it's a bill, there's a difference. This bill may be the ultimate in equal rights for women because women may now be drafted. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure this is what the people want who are advocates, advocates for equal rights for women. All right, second thing, we've got some people in the church who advocate for war. Mm -hmm. And when they do this, they're thinking, well, We've got a volunteer army and they'll do the fighting. That's what they're volunteering to do. Mm -hmm. This could change overnight because your sons are registered for military conscription. Right. Your sons could be called up very quickly, just like that, to fight some war that you have promoted. Mm -hmm. And here's the kicker. I know a lot of guys who promote war and they have these sweet little daughters and granddaughters. These sweet little girls could become subject to the draft. They could end up in some foxhole in the Middle East, carrying a rifle, getting shot at. And I know a lot of these folks who advocate for war will say, but I don't want women fighting. Right. But again, you've got to be careful what you ask for because you might get it. Yeah. And the world always takes things further than you think it will because it's Satan's world. Exactly. Right. Before you start advocating that our country get tough and go kick somebody's rear end in another part of the world, you might want to keep in mind that your daughters or granddaughters could end up in uniform. Now, let's put a little disclaimer. On this show, we try to avoid, like the plague, being chicken little, have, having scare tactics, screaming about the how the sky is falling. We try to avoid that. Yeah. We don't do a lot of speculation in the thing that I called woulda, coulda, shoulda. Oh, mm -hmm. this could happen. Really that. That. We, we don't get into that. But as Bernard says, every church of God that has a doctrine against Christians participating in carnal warfare and we, that, do, we do have a doctrine. And we do, that is our doctrine yeah. in CGI. And he says every COG that has a doctrine against Christians participating in carnal warfare, he says that church of God needs to be thinking about this and perhaps having some kind of a plan in place mm -hmm. to help your young people. Mm -hmm. On the converse side, Bernard doesn't say this, but I'm just logically deducing, if a church of God out there, and there are some that have no problem with Christians participating in carnal warfare, mm -hmm. well, it's not an issue. If the young people in your church, both men and women, get drafted, 
then you just, I guess, mm -hmm. encourage them to go. As, as a couple of people in the chat room pointed out, you know, in Israel, men and women are yes, they do. conscripted. It's been that way for a while. Yeah. Been that way since the 60s, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you, Bernie, for sending us this article. Um, we're gonna we're gonna look at this more and see how things develop. Yeah. Maybe it's a tempest in a teapot. Yeah. Maybe this thing's gonna end. But if it keeps going, we're gonna have to deal with this, as Bernard says. Again, out there, we want to hear your thoughts in the chat room. Send us an email, wdy49 at yahoo.com. All right, let's move on to the subject that's in the news at this time. I know that a lot of people in church are all concerned about the vacancy on the Supreme Court that was caused by the death of Antonin Scalia. I'm concerned about this new vacancy, but probably from a different point of view than most people. My, my concern starts with the fact that the present presidential campaign is already vulgar. Mm -hmm. I don't mean just ugly, it's vulgar. And embarrassing. Embarrassing. These guys are calling each other names constantly. They have now degenerated to the point where they're calling each other the names of female body parts. I can't even say the names that they're calling each other. This is vulgar. Yeah. I mean, if I had kids, even if they were teenagers, I would not want them listening to some of the things that, that are being said. Mm -hmm. So my concern is that the Supreme Court vacancy debate it's just going to add another layer of insanity and vulgarity to this train wreck that we're calling a presidential debate. And I got to ask the question, am I the only one left alive on this earth who remembers the Kennedy-Nixon debates? I wasn't even born. I, I know. And that's why, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you try to get somebody to watch recordings of the Nixon-Kennedy debates today or read the transcripts of these debates, a lot of people would say, this is boring. There's too much substance. They'd say, I need excitement, I need drama, I need some name calling. I need it to be more like reality TV. So again, my concern is that this new Supreme Court variable is going to even further erode our uncivil debate going on right now. And this whole thing is such a, an attraction to a lot of church people. And I know this because I see your Facebook pages. And I think a lot of people forget that when you like something on your Facebook page, mm -hmm it shows up on your friends' pages that you liked it. Yeah. I see what you're liking. I see what you're talking about. And I'm not seeking it out. It's not like I'm stalking your Facebook page. Because we're Facebook friends, it pops up on my wall when you like some of this stuff. Now, let's real quickly point out a couple of interesting points regarding the Supreme Court. First of all, while Scalia was alive, the religious composition of the court was six Catholics and three Jews. That was the composition, no Protestants. Wow. I'm not saying that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. I'm just pointing out a statistic. Right. Six Catholic, three Jews, no Protestants. Second, with the death of Scalia, this is the first time that the court does not have a Republican majority since 1972. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know that. Wow. And right now it's tied. Half of the justices were, report, were uh, appointed by pre uh, Democratic presidents. Half were appointed by Republicans. It's four and four. Prior to that, it has been majority Republican since 1972. That's over 40 years that the court has had a majority of Republican appointees. I looked this up. And it hasn't always been a 5-4 court. Sometimes it was like seven Republicans and two Democrats. And I think for a while it was even eight and one hmm. for a while. Now, this is a religious talk show. So why am I even talking about the composition of the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, I'm leading up to something. Hang in there. Let me start by giving you my personal testimony. You know I don't vote anymore. I haven't since 1980. And when I did, I was what they called a single issue voter. That is, there was really only one issue that really, really concerned me. And this one issue concerned me more than all the others put together. And that issue was abortion. I am really, really anti-abortion. And that's what drove my politics for years when I was in politics. I would always look at the candidates, I'd always look at the parties, and i say, I'm going with the people who are anti-abortion. But I stopped voting after 1980 for several reasons, not just one, several, and one of the reasons was this. I could no longer trust what my party at the time, the Republican Party, that was my party, I couldn't trust them to defend the unborn. Now, when I make that statement, I know there are going to be people, be people out there that's going to take great exception. Some people are going to get mad. They're going to say, of course, the Republican Party is the party that defends the unborn. Bear with me now. Just hang in there. 
Since 1972, I have watched with dismay that even though the court was dominated by Republican appointees, it would not reverse itself on Roe v. Wade. And the court has had several opportunities to do so, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. And the time period that really surprised me on this issue was between 2001 and 2007. And these were the first six years of the presidency of George W. Bush. In his first six years as president, we had a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican Supreme Court. That six consecutive years of the of Republicans holding all the levers of power in the federal government. And yet they did absolutely nothing that I could see that I and let me put that qualifier, nothing I could see to do away with abortion. And if I'm wrong on this, I want someone to let me know and I will retract this statement. I will apologize because I don't want to be putting out false information on this show. So, mm -hmm. so you're saying that not, not we all know that nothing was passed. It wasn't, you know, reversed. You're saying right. that they never submitted a bill. There was never a vote on the floor. Well, they never passed a bill that yeah. I know of. The Supreme Court had opportunities to reverse themselves and they didn't. Uh -huh. They didn't have the votes. Yeah. They didn't have five votes to reverse themselves, okay. even though they had a majority Republican court. And they also think they had a majority Republican court pass gay marriage in our country. Exactly. And Roe yeah. v. Wade yeah. was yeah. passed under a right. Republican chief justice. But I want to get back to this. This is a very important point. If I've said anything wrong, I want you to tell me because I don't want to put out false information. Once we put out false information, like a lot of crazy websites do, we lose our credibility totally. So if I have to publicly admit and apologize I say that I say something wrong, I will do that. But I don't think I'm wrong on this because over the years, I have brought this observation up to people in the church who are Republicans, and no one has shown me that there was anything done by the Republicans about abortion between 2001 and 2007 on a federal level. I know what I'm saying on a federal level because mm -hmm. I'm not getting into what the states did or didn't do. We're talking feds. Again, this statement that I make should never be perceived as my promoting the Democrats. I mean, does anyone think that the Democrats <laughs> are going to do anything about abortion? <laughs> no, not. I, no, no. All I'm saying is that this is one of the reasons I don't trust either party. And here's the reason I even bring this whole thing up. Some of you are getting into the argument that you don't want Obama to appoint a replacement for Scalia. You want it to be done by the next president and you hope he'll be a Republican. And that's fine if that's what you want to advocate. I'm not, I won't go against that. I'm not going to disagree with that position. My admonition to you is this, be careful. Don't get your hopes up like I once did. When you give your reasons why you want the next Supreme Court justice to be appointed by a Republican, I suggest you not give abortion as the reason as to why you want him to be appointed by a Republican. I mean, come up with reasons, fine, anything you want, that's fine. But if you use abortion as the reason why you want a Republican Supreme Court justice, it will show that you're not looking at your recent history because again, we've had a Republican court for over 40 years. And again, sometimes it's been seven and two in favor of the Republicans and it didn't do us in the anti-abortion movement a bit of good. Now, another qualifier. Am I predicting that if the next justice is Republican and the court goes back to being Republican by 5-4, that that court will not strike down Roe v. Wade? No, not making that prediction. I'm simply saying that if history is any indicator of the future, I'm not going to get excited about the Supreme Court from an anti-abortion point of view. I fell for it years ago. I'm not falling for it again. Again, I get all kinds of emails from you all on these types of subjects. And I'd like to read one from uh, uh, Robert Cross. He wrote this to me in response to my comments on the Christian Educational Ministries Genesis Bible study that I do over at borntowin.net. And here's what Robert wrote. He said, Wes, he said, you went a little long in your final commentary. <laughs> Whoa. Wait, Why wait, are we not doing this? We can't high five on this one, Jeff. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Totally inappropriate. <laughs> totally inappropriate. Can't high five okay. Robert. All right, but Robert says, <laughs> you said something that we American Christians need to hear a lot more of. Still quoting Robert. He said, I listened to your study just hours after learning of the death of Supreme Court Justice Scalia. He said, everywhere on conservative internet websites, people were bewailing what his death was going to mean to the future of the country. Uh -huh. While there's, and this is Robert talking, still quoting Robert. 
While there's every reason to anticipate and even quote unquote more progressive court decisions now, mm -hmm. we Christians seem to have forgotten the reality of the world we're living in. He says, we know from scriptures that in the end times, men will become worse and worse. Right. And the governments of these men will become more and more antagonistic towards God and towards those who proclaim authority over their lives. Mm -hmm. Still quoting Robert. Still, we want to believe that our politicians and our judges are going to be our saviors, despite the fact that our surrounding culture is already past the point of redemption. It, it passed that a long time ago. Robert says we need to ex acknowledge that, that the church in America is the church of Laodicea in Revelation, that we have put our faith in. In, in fallen men, in materialism, in our bank accounts, in creature comforts, in everything except what Christians are supposed to have faith in, which is the love and faithfulness of our Almighty Father and the redeeming triumph of our real Savior, Jesus Christ, end quote. I think Robert brings up some really good points. He searched in American churches, Laodicean. And as much as I want to take exception to Robert on that, I have a hard time defending the church. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the Sabbath keeping churches of God as a whole. I mean, all you've got to do is read the journal. That's an independent church of God newspaper. It doesn't take long to figure out the church of God has some problems. You look at things posted on the internet by church members and you have to realize the church has some problems. Mm -hmm. Now question, what is the spirit of Laodicea that Robert's talking about? Well, you know, we've already talked too much on this. We're running out of time. I'm going to save this discussion, the spirit of Laodicea for another time. All because right. we've got to do a show on church eras. We got yeah. to do that. So we got to do that because saying, hopefully. Uh, hopefully soon. But we again, we got so much stuff to talk about. We've got to do this. Talk about the church eras because this is a false doctrine. And it is something that has messed up parts of the church of God really, really bad. It mm -hmm. has warped the thinking of some church people. The church era doctrine has done a lot of harm to Christians who are trying to show love for one another but it doesn't work because we've got each other classified as you're Sardis, you're Laodicea, I'm Philadelphia, my brother is Ephesus, all this kind of stuff. It's nonsense. It's ridiculous. We've got to deal with it, but we're going to do it on another time. Okay. We're going to continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Lady Tex had a real great comment. She said that the, the two different parties were two wings of the same bird which is a very nice way of putting it. Um, so. There are quite a few people who remember the Nixon-Kennedy debate, so you're not the really? only, really? The they must only be old bogey in the chat room. I think some, my mom, I think, or my dad texted me they were riding their bike during the debate or something. Oh, like yeah. so they were, you know what that means. They were you're older than them. Yeah, I'm older. <laughs> well, I, no, 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 I was a kid, oh, okay. but I did watch pieces of it. Okay. okay. And, okay. and Pat said that you are right about them not pro uh, passing anything or no nothing being done by Roe versus about Roe v. Wade, uh -huh. that they made promises, but they didn't do anything. Exactly. They made promises and they didn't keep them. All right. We've got some more to talk about regarding the Supreme Court vacancy. Jeff is going to talk about it from a totally different vantage point than yeah. I just did. And we need to, uh, to have our discussion about attracting and young people in the church. Again, we're just going to start that discussion tonight because we've got so much material, so much to talk about. But first, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Wes White, and welcome to another Bible Q&A. We received the following question, can angels marry? And this question goes on to explain, they say, doesn't Genesis 6, 2 seem to indicate that fallen angels or demons married human women? And weren't their offspring an evil race of giants? Fascinating question. Genesis 6, 2 says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. It's important to note that when people promote the idea that fallen angels, which are demons, cohabitated with human women and created evil offspring, Genesis 6, 2 is the only scripture that they have to back up this claim. There's no other scripture that touches on this subject. So before we make any outlandish claims about Genesis 6 2, let's make sure that we understand this scripture, what it really says and what it doesn't say. 
First thing that we need to understand is that the term sons of God in Scripture means many things. People who promote this doctrine of fallen angels marrying women like to refer to the following scriptures, and they say this proves that sons of God in the Bible always means fallen angels. And I don't have time to actually read all these scriptures that I'm going to mention. Please write these scriptures down so that you can read them for yourself later. Don't use this program or any other program as like a set of cliff notes, which you simply study very brief, very briefly, make a decision, and then move on to something else. No, slow down. Take some time to actually read these scriptures that we're going to mention. All right, here are the scriptures that these people use to claim that sons of God in Genesis 2 means fallen angels. There are three scriptures. First is Job chapter 1, verse 6, Job 2, 1, and Job 38, 7. And these folks are correct that these three scriptures very clearly indicate that sons of God can mean angels. But what they don't point out is that there are other definitions of sons of God in the Bible several others, and here they are. Again, please write them down and read them later. Look them up. Son of God, singular, obviously can mean Jesus. That's an easy one. We find that in Matthew 3, 17, Mark 1, 11, Luke 1, 35, John 1, 14, and Romans 1, verses 3 and 4. Sons of God can mean the descendants of Israel or the people of Israel. We find this in Deuteronomy 32, 8. And Deuteronomy 32, 43. Sons of God can mean the kings of Israel. We find that in 2 Samuel 7, 14. We find it in Psalm 89, verses 26 and 27. And we find it in Psalm 2, 7. Sons of God can mean the nation of Israel. We find that in Exodus 4, 22. And we find it in Exodus 11, 1. Son of God can mean Adam. We find that in Luke 3.38. Sons of God can mean mankind in general. And we find that in Acts 17, verses 26 through 29, and in Psalm 82, verse 6. Sons of God can refer to the church of God. We find that in Romans 8.14. We find it in Romans 8.29 and 30. And we find it in Hebrews 2.10. Please look these up. So you see, the term sons of God in the Bible has many possible definitions. Never let anyone tell you that the term sons of God in the Bible can only mean one thing, whether it's fallen angels or Christians or mankind in general or whatever. Also, we can't forget that Matthew 22:30 tells us what we are going to be like in the kingdom of God after we're resurrected, after we're resurrected. It says, "For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven." What it's saying here is that angels are sexless. They don't marry. They don't reproduce. Scripture says so. Well, then, if angels can't marry and reproduce, then who are the sons of God in Genesis 6-2? The answer, it's mankind in general. One of the definitions that we read, it's all human beings, descendants of Adam. That's all it means. Well, if angels cannot marry and reproduce, where did this whole idea come from that's in the churches now if it didn't come from the Bible? It's simple. It came from pagan mythology. And you know all these stories. You might have studied them in high school literature class, like when the Greek god Zeus came down and he raped some human woman and their offspring was the mighty Hercules. Or in Greek mythology, we see where some bull has relations with some woman and their offspring was this hideous creature called the Monitor. And, and I'm sorry to bring up such disgusting things as bestiality and rape, but, but this cross-species cohabitation nonsense needs to be addressed. People are asking about it. They're confused by it. We know from Scripture that God created different kinds you can call them species, you can call them kinds, whatever you want. The point is that God created these kinds and they cannot cohabitate. There's the God kind, there's the angelic kind, there's the human kind, there's the dog kind, the cat kind, the horse kind, the cattle kind, on and on it goes. 
Today, science is trying to develop cross species through DNA gene splicing, and this is dangerous. It's playing with fire. God created these kinds separately, and it's unnatural for us to try to scientifically combine them into some new hybrid species. Now, someone might be saying, well, what about when Mary was pregnant with Jesus? Wasn't that an example of the God kind crossing over into the mankind? Uh-uh, no. We know from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that man was made in the image of God. And then we learn in scripture that man was created for the purpose of being reborn into the God family and living eternally with God. In other words, the God kind and the mankind are of the same kind. It's just that at this moment, in this age, the mankind has not been allowed to grow into his full potential in the family of God, in the family of God. But that's coming with the return of Jesus. God designed man to become part of the God kind. God did not design man so that he could crossbreed with horses or pigs or cows or angels. If this angelic slash human crossbreeding took place in ancient times, why isn't it happening today? If fallen angels could produce children with women back then, they'd be doing it right now. And it's obvious it's not happening now. No, humans and angels never cohabitated. They never had offspring. Again, people who promote this have only one scripture to go by, and this one scripture in Genesis proves nothing of that sort. At CGI, we've got more information on this subject of giants. We have a whole sermon on the subject. It tells about Nephilim and Rephaim in the Old Testament. This sermon is on our website at cgi.org. It's free. Check it out. We'll see you next time on Bible Q&A at cgi.org. And in the meantime, please keep reading your Bible and please keep asking questions. In the early days of the church, there was a great controversy between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. A dividing line seemed to have been drawn between converts of Jerusalem apostles and congregations led by Paul. We know that there was a time when Paul was upset with Peter over issues dealing with the treatment of Gentiles. Was it a situation where Paul taught that the law was done away with? Or was it a situation where Paul taught against a perverse and apostate religion? that claim to represent the teachings of the Old Testament. We would like to offer you a free booklet entitled, The Book of Galatians, A Commentary. It's free. You can get it here at cgi.org. Again, the title is, The Book of Galatians, A Commentary, at cgi.org. back. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, we're going to talk more about the Supreme Court vacancy. Jeff's got uh, his take on it. But right. Before we do that, Nancy, do we have anything in the chat room? Yeah, we had a comment from Grubber's friend. He said um, that we had no official position on homosexuality or abortion. Why speak out about the draft of women? And I asked him to clarify, and here's his clarification. When did the church ever make public announcements before? It sounds like the church is campaigning against the draft of women. Will we contact the press and politicians? So um, I would just start out by saying I, I don't think that we're, we're saying the, they should make this decision or they shouldn't. No, make we're saying when the world is evil, the world's going to do what it does. Yeah. But we as Christians have to do the right thing. Yeah, let's back up here. We are not taking a position on whether or not they should draft women. Yeah. That's not the pos that's not the job of CGI. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the CGI did not take an official position on uh, the Supreme Court and homosexual marriage. Which we did not, points out. Yeah. We, we did not take a position mm -hmm. on that. We're not taking a position on drafting of women. What we're saying is that if the this bill becomes law, we have to be prepared for it, mm -hmm. but we're not lobbying against uh, against this bill. Because passing. the church yeah. does have a position about whether or not you should go into the military, which we dealt with in a right. previous spring on the Sabbath. And we have a position right. against homosexuality for teaching your children, right. your family, mm -hmm. those things. Yeah, because it's not we don't 
Yeah. Campaign for it. We're not. We're not. We, we don't obsess it. about it and name yeah. call and all that. Okay. okay. Good. Hope that clarifies. If that doesn't clarify, uh, send us a question again, and we'll see if we can get or, it right. Or email Wes at wdy49 at yahoo.com. Yeah. Either way, let us, statement. Yeah, okay. let us know. Okay. All right, uh, Jeff. What have you got for us? All right. Uh, well, shortly after uh, Justice Scalia passed away, there was talk on social media and different news websites, and I'm talking this is really quickly, like even the same evening, mm -hmm. uh, that perhaps it wasn't a natural death. Uh, perhaps it was a conspiracy by global warming hoaxers, uh, the president, Illuminati, or whatever. And so I guess the death of a 79-year-old man is somehow surprising <laughs> to a lot of people, uh, or, or a, suspicious. A, a slightly overweight Yeah, or, or suspicious. Yeah. Even when all those close to him, you know, confirmed it was a natural death. So there was a poll uh, on conservativeoutfitters.com uh, that asked the question, do you suspect foul play in the death of Justice Scalia? And so 78% voted yes, really? and 22% voted no. 78? 78% voted yes. Wow. And that's after 59,690 responses within a couple of days. Uh, I guess a lot of people are going to close from there. Mm -hmm. And my vote was no. <laughs> you know, but, and radio talk show host Michael Savage, I'm not familiar who this is, but I found this. Uh, I don't really know who he is, but somebody was saying that, uh, in a quote that he asked his, uh, his millions of listeners, was Scalia murdered on his show? Mm -hmm. And he also said on the show, we need a Warren Commission-like federal investigation. This is serious business. And there are many more in the media who are advancing the same ideas. And, and I believe this is reckless and irresponsible of the media. Again, I don't advocate any type of conspiracy theories. And it's also been a public position of our church and some of the media things we do. Tony Bukert. I did a really good Armor of God a few years ago uh, about conspiracy theories. And it seems almost every predominant news item, someone has a conspiracy theory about it. I've noticed this as a, as a trend. Uh, like the Chipotle, uh, E. coli outbreak, uh, the Zika virus. Uh, I think somebody was, was linking, linking Zika to like GMO mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. I, 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 thought, I, I found that was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a recent mathematics study about conspiracy theories. And I'd, I'd read this, heard about this before. And, and this was reported on the BBC News website a few weeks ago. And so here's what they found out. I'm going to read from the website. Uh, it's difficult to keep a conspiracy theory under wraps, scientists say, because sooner or later one of the conspirators will blow its cover. Yeah. A study has examined how long alleged conspiracies could survive before being revealed, deliberately or unwittingly, to the public at large. Uh, Dr. David Grimes from Oxford University devised an equation to express this and then applied it to, the, to four famous collisions. Uh, the work appears in the Plus One Journal. An equation developed by Dr. Grimes, a postdoctoral physicist at Oxford, relied upon three factors. The number of conspirators involved, the amount of time that has passed, and the intrinsic probability of a conspiracy failing. He then applied his equation to four famous conspiracy theories. Uh, the belief that the moon landing was faked, uh, the belief that climate change is a fraud, the belief that vaccines cause autism, and the belief that pharmaceutical companies have suppressed the cure for cancer. So Dr. Grimes' analysis suggested that if these four conspiracies were real, and he wasn't making a judgment whether they were real or not, he says most are very likely to have been revealed as such by now. He says specifically the moon landing hoax would have been revealed in 3.7 years based on his formula. Uh, the climate change fraud in 3.7, 26.8, or some flexibility in that. Uh, the vaccine autism conspiracy in 3.2 to 34.8 years. And the cancer conspiracy in 3.2 years. So, so I guess we'll about the vaccine autism, since that's recent, that could still you know, be, be later on. But he says, using a handful of assumptions combined with a mathematical deduction Dr. Grimes produced a general but incomplete formula. And, and, and so how did he get this, we wondered, how, well, how did he get this data to figure out how, you know, to figure out a mathematical formula, how that conspiracy th theories fall apart. We actually analyzed some real conspiracies because there have been real conspiracies that have happened and people have blew the whistle on these conspiracies. So the first conspiracy was the surveillance program conducted by the U.S. National Security Agency, NSA, known as PRISM. Mm -hmm. And so this program involved at most 36,000 people and was, and we know was revealed famously by Edward Snowden after six years the program was in place. Mm -hmm. so, that's the, so that's some of the numbers he used. Mm -hmm. The second was the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in which the cure for syphilis, which is penicillin, was purposefully withheld from African-American patients. 
And so this experiment, uh, and, and it just took place you know, years ago, it may have involved the 6,700 people who were involved in, in, in conducting this experiment. And Dr. Peter Buxton, he blew the whistle after about 25 years. He, he let people know about this conspiracy. Uh, the third was an FBI scandal in which it was revealed by Dr. Frederick Whitehurst that the agency's forensic analysis was unscientific and misleading, resulting in the imprisonment and execution of innocent people. And so he estimates that there was a maximum of 500 people that could have been involved in this conspiracy, and that took about six years for the scandal to be exposed. So the equation he created represents the best case scenario for conspirators. That is, it is optimistically assumes that the conspirators are really good at keeping secrets and that there are no external investigations at play. Mm -hmm. I generally, you know, in my, 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 the way I look at things, I generally agree with this study. For grand conspiracies to be kept secret, a lot of people have to remain quiet. The moon landing involved over 411,000 NASA employees. Some of the people here may have known some of them because there, there, there were a lot of people who worked for NASA back then. Uh, and that's a lot of people to keep quiet. Uh, human nature is the opposite. We don't keep secrets very well. Especially now that we have social media. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, you have social media. Yeah. So when you generally understand how many people it would involve to maintain a conspiracy, it's, to me, it's very unlikely that they, it would have any merit. And the study didn't even factor in the investigator reporters. <laughs> Because they have very big incentives, incentives for uncovering truth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have examples of Watergate. We have an example of Bill Flynn and Monica Lewinsky. Mm -hmm. People tried to cover these up, but the press has incentive, mm -hmm. right? They have financial incentive by selling papers, selling mm -hmm. magazines. They have professional incentive because they want to win prizes, Pulitzer Prize and stuff, to expose these type of things. So they're very motivated, at least in, as far as exposing things. So what is the biblical perspective on conspiracy theories? Well, we'll look at First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. So verse Timothy 1 verse 3 says, As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. So he says we're not to waste our time with fables. I'm not, I'm not talking Aesop's fables. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm talking, he says the Greek word for fable is uh, muthos, which means, you know, Mufal sounds like myth, which means fiction or myth. Mm -hmm. And also can mean speculation. Some translations translate it speculation, which is what a conspiracy theory is. And again, this is talking about false doctrines, but a lot of false doctrines are speculations. Right. I mean, most all of them are, you know, people have no proof. So it's easy, it's easy to speculate when you have no proof. And so I believe as a Christian, I shouldn't wildly speculate about things. Because mm -hmm. to me, to, be, to me, it'd be the equivalent of bearing false witness. And that's very serious according to God's word. And so, so, and unfortunately, why I bring this up is that too many people waste time with it with these type of things. And, and so many of the most popular websites, and even with Christians in the United States, and I can, I can give you the numbers, are, are put together by people advocating these type of theories. And I find it sad that these websites are so popular, and, and, and sites like ours that are promoting the gospel are not getting nowhere near the numbers of people that promote these type of things. And also, conspiracy theories feed on two things Christians should not have. And that's number one is fear, and second is ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, second Timothy one says, uh, Second Timothy uh, chapter one verse seven says, "For God has given us not a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind." So he's saying here that love and a sound mind are the opposite of fear, because God's spirit that, that, that if we give when we're baptized, that we're given, will give us God's spirit. Believe this, will give you discernment and knowledge and the ability to, to think rationally. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 23 says, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. And some translations say, and there's some translations that say this, uh, ignorant speculations, uh, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but to be gentle to all. So we shouldn't argue with folks about these type of things. Uh, able to teach patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. You know, some, some people may you know, disagree, right? But you correct them uh, in humility. Uh, if God perhaps will grant them repentance that they may know the truth. And so teaching people biblical truth, that's my passion. Mm -hmm. My calling, I believe, and my goal, I think it's a goal of our webcast, we agree, our goal mm -hmm. is, is biblical truth. So we, we, and we want to be mature Christians. And, and a lot of times that means for be, uh, being a mature Christian, that we got to put away assumptions, yeah, or, or we. And too many things people assume things. I, I myself, 
mm -hmm. have learned how I've made assumptions about things and been completely wrong. Right. Uh, we have to, we have to, you know, change our ways of thinking uh, and our human nature. And, and how that's how's that? We put off our sinful nature and we put on the mind of Christ by Bible study, studying God's Spending word. Spending more time with Him than on the news shows or on whatever else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like at the end, I, I wish that people would put more time into studying God's word sure. and thinking thinking about things that God has, which is the most wonderful thing in the world, <laughs> than, you know, mm -hmm. you know what, what happened on the moon. Yeah, you know, and it's yeah. not going to depress you because yeah, all yeah. this other news and right. stuff depressing It's you. depressing. Yeah. But yeah. Reading, reading about our great future and what God has planned for us, yeah. the sacrifice of Jesus, I mean, that brings joy and peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as, as, as my mentor, as our mentor Yoda in the Empire Strikes Back, Said he said you must learn un you must unlearn what you have learned. I think that's what a Christian does. We have to we we learn so much when we grow up. There's so much that's that's feed, fed to us on the internet and things, and again also it's peer pressure. And we have uh, even even older posts. We have peer pressure like with Facebook. We we comments and people put these posts and say oh everybody's thinking this way because they they have these things. And there's, peer, there's all types of things that can cloud our thinking, but we have to re we have to keep our mind. In focus with God's spirit. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Uh, he says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Mm -hmm. And these, these type of theories to me are just childish. We need to be Christian adults. You know, thanks, Jeff. Say, so Jeff, you, um, uh, you're preaching in Tyler tomorrow, huh? Yeah, preaching right here is where we're at in Tyler. Okay, so we, Tyler. we want everyone to tune in tomorrow. Yeah, we we'll CGI got webcast board. right here. Uh, you're, you're, you're here right now. You're in the right place. Eleven o'clock central. Yeah, you're right and place. what are you going to talk about in church tomorrow? Uh, I'm giving the sermon I gave last week in Dallas. But I'm giving it here. It's on five stones. I can't remember who asked about five stones. Mm -hmm. If you're out there, let me know who asked. Oh yeah, right in somebody, our chat. Somebody asked oh, about five okay. stones. In the web Why did David take five stones? Why did David take five and, stones? And you're going to go through the whole trouble of giving a whole sermon based on one question. Yeah, one question. I said, you know what? Why did he have five stones? So yeah. I looked into it in detail. So okay, excellent. They got to speak yeah. the truth, not a conspiracy theory. No, yeah, the, the conspiracy <laughs> with the five stones. <laughs> no. yeah. oh, well, hopefully, I'll speak truth. But again, when it comes to truth. Everyone here, we have to realize, everyone here, we can make mistakes. Yeah. So we can, like, like Wes said earlier, he, what he's been saying could be completely wrong. We, we have to let our lives be based on God's word mm -hmm. and on evidence. And, and, be, and if we are corrected, and I've been corrected a lot, mm -hmm. take the humility and say, okay, I was wrong. I made that, a mistake. That, I'm that, sorry. That's, that's, that's part of being a mature Christian, I believe. Yeah. You know, you talk about conspiracy theories. When I first came into church, one of the cons first conspiracy theories I was taught was this. Uh, there's a book out called The Passover Plot that was out and it was real popular in the 70s. And they said that the resurrection was faked and that it was a conspiracy by the 12, well, 11 apostles. Yeah. Well, no, 12, because they said Judas was the ringleader of mm -hmm. this conspiracy. And so I came to the... Just, he went to all the trouble of killing himself to... Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, the bottom line is this. And as this, this formula points out, every conspiracy has a rat. And yeah. if you work in law enforcement, you know every conspiracy has a rat. You give him immunity, and he'll rat out all the <laughs> others, and he'll sing like a baby. Yeah. And, 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 and so what I came to the conclusion was that if this was a conspiracy, the resurrection by 12 guys... Somebody would have it, rat Somebody would have... It's, it's the yeah. best conspiracy that ever existed in the history of mankind because nobody ratted out. And these guys went to their deaths... All except John, yeah. but of course horrible there was death. horrible death. John, Not a, yeah, you're right about that. And we, if we apply this formula, if you apply this, this formula, formula to that you're going to see a single, not a single person around. said anything that the, 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 that that there was a conspiracy or this yeah. happened. They all said the truth. Yeah, Christ, Christ was resurrected. So I came to a conclusion yeah. early in my in my uh, walk with Christ that th there was no conspiracy. The Jesus resurrection was provable. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I gave a sermon on it several years ago called Our Faith in Jesus Christ. If you want to get it, it's free here on CGI. And I talk yeah, it's about it. probably on our website if it's a few years ago, but we could always look it up and see if we can get it on there. Yeah. And if you can't find it on our website, uh, send us an email and I'll forward it to Jeff and we'll see if we can get it out there. And we do have that uh, program about conspiracy theories that Tony Booker did. And he yeah. talks about that same one. That's the one he's talking about yeah. in his. Uh, 
that conspiracy is, with is, Jesus. is, is made, made, uh, the major point of that armor of God. Okay, good. Very, very similar. Now we've got to plug the feast sites. Uh, Jeff, what feast sites do you want to plug tonight? Uh, just the same ones we talked about last week, which I had a list in front of me. And since I don't have a list of we'll today, go for memory. I'm going for memory. So we have Myrtle Beach. Uh huh. And then make sure I don't forget anything. Then we have down in Florida, we have Pinellas Park, which is, I call it Pinellas Park, but people like to, like to properly call it St. Uh, Petersburg. Yeah. But it's a place called Pinellas Park. Uh, and that's on the beach. So that's two. And then we have the one down in uh, Fort Walton. Is that what they call it? The Common Faith Common Ministries. Common Faith Ministries. We're, we're working with other groups on that one. And uh, then we have the one uh, Land Between the Lakes. Land Between the Lakes. Wagner. In Wagner. Yes. Yeah, Wynn right would be very upset. With yeah, if you didn't mention Wagner, Wagner Wynn's going to be all over all of us. Be all set. And then uh, Ontario, Canada. Yeah, Ontario, Canada. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and I know Murray's putting that together up there, which is, uh, and we have information about Ontario, uh, the one in Oklahoma, and the one on Lamb Twin Lakes. That information is now on our website. Okay. Oh, they're uh, finally catching up to yeah, us. Yeah, doing yeah. Lamb Lakes. We're doing so much about Lamb Twin Lakes that other people were like, well, like is there any we other websites? <laughs> yeah, we need some so, so we have information about those. And as we get information, as soon as we, as soon as we get information, about that other fee sites. You'll put we, it up. We will put that up there. Is there any information about Land Between the Lakes on our website? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Just, just a little bit. Oh, we're going to have a ball at I Land Between the Lakes. I hope you have your reservations because okay. we have ours. And don't forget, we're going to be here again next Friday night at 730 for Bring on the Sabbath. Right. But then two weeks from tonight, tune in at 8 o'clock because Jeff is going to be uh, giving a sermon live from the Philippines. Yay. That's the plan. All those congregations the out there are getting together. They've asked Jeff to preach. He's going to give a dynamite sermon, and you get to watch him live mm -hmm. from the Philippines, eight o'clock, two weeks from so tonight. Let's pray for safe travel. Yeah. Yes. Pray um, for pray for Bill perfect. and Jeff to have a safe trip there and back. Yeah. That's right. And if you stay up late enough at about midnight, Bill Watson will be having a webcast of his Bible study. Is it going to be on CGI.org? On CGI.org. Okay. It's a Bible study. Watch the replay. If you All can't right. stay up that late, watch the replay. All right, here's the deal. Set your alarm for midnight so that if you're watching Jeff and you get bored and fall asleep, you wake you up. That's a very big possibility. And then at midnight you wake up and hear Bill. How's yeah, that? Is yeah. that a fair deal? So that's what you it's going to be great. So y'all be sure and tune in. But that's not next week. No, we Next week we're going to be we back here. Next. Same time. First Friday same, same. of March that we're... That First Friday in March. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other? Oh, oh a couple comments. Uh, I got a comment here from Shutzi uh, about the um, uh, Republican um, Roe v. Wade. He, here's what he said. This is sarcasm. Okay. He says, if the Republicans were to reverse Roe v. Wade, they would lose a future campaign issue. No, oh, that's Shutzi talking. That's oh, funny. Okay. That's so, funny. We're not saying that. We're just quoting. What, okay. Have you got anything in there? Uh, no, no. Okay, no other comments? All right. Okay, let's take a break. Don't go away, come back, uh, because we're going to talk about our important topic of getting young people to stay in the church. Briefly. And, br briefly. Okay. Briefly. Not so, stay in the church briefly, but talk. Yeah, so we'll, briefly. we'll be right back. And recording. One, two. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand. 
stand up, stand up for Jesus, this time will not be long. This day in the noise of battle, the next of victory song. To him that overcometh, a cloud of light shall be. The Christian church was born on the day of Pentecost. This was approximately seven weeks after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And on that birthday of the church, Peter preached the church's first sermon where he said to repent. Repentance was the first command given to the body of Christ. And if those folks back then had not repented, they couldn't have become part of the church. That's right, because repentance is at the heart of the kingdom of God's message. Also, repentance is actually a gift. You may find these things hard to believe. If so, you need to ask for our free booklet entitled, 10 Facts You Should Know About Repentance. It's free. You can get it at our website at cgi.org. Again, that's 10 Facts You Should Know About Repentance at cgi.org. We're back. Thanks for still being with us. Uh, let's see, a couple of things. First of all, Nancy, you have a comment from the yeah. chat room. I just wanted to point out that there was uh, quite a bit of discussion from the chat room based on experience of a couple of people that one of the fruits of war, the results of being a soldier in active war can be PTSD. And that that hurts not only the soldier, uh, but also the families that they've come back to that can really yeah. have a lot of trouble and harm based on this. Yeah, it's most unfortunate. I had a whole bunch of my buddies in high school that went to the Vietnam War and they came back with all kinds of problems. The mm -hmm. ones that came back alive, they came back uh, mentally and physically just destroyed and they're still suffering to this day. Our hearts go out to all of yeah. you and our prayers. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, absolutely. While, while we were, uh, we talk against military service, we, we believe, you know, in showing love for for everybody. And we never speak against the veterans. No. We're never going to say anything against really. them. Okay. Oh, also, uh, there were some comments engendered about the um, Sons of God Bible Q&A that we played tonight mm -hmm. about the angels marrying. I want to give you a little heads up. Uh, in our Genesis Bible study. And, now, and, and, and explain this, not beer around your neck. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> microphone. Okay. Yeah, if you, no, yeah, there, microphone. There's yeah, this yeah, discussion yeah. about that is not a keg of beer. Uh, uh, that's an oversized microphone. It's a Bluetooth microphone for long distance and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But anyway, uh, in the Genesis Bible study that's going to start in uh, May, the first Sabbath in May, right here on Bring on the Sabbath, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about, I think it's like eight or nine different types of sons of God that are mentioned in the Bible. Cool. And that's where confusion comes in about angels. Angels are sons of God, mm -hmm. but every time sons of God is mentioned in the Bible, it's not necessarily angels. There are all kinds of definitions, and we're going to go into great detail about that. We think that you're going to have a lot of fun with us on this Genesis Bible study. Mm -hmm. Okay, all, uh, that's all for that. Let's get going, um, and we're going to have to cut this a little bit short, but we're going to continue this discussion for weeks and weeks. This week, we're going to start the dialogue on getting and keeping young people in church. We, we want to begin by reading from an article that was posted on the website, honestalwayswordpress.com. It was on February 6th. The title is Struggles of the Third and Fourth Generation Christian and Why They Keep Leaving the Church. That's very recent. Very recent. Okay. And I'm sorry, I don't know who wrote it. I could not find the writer's name. If you know what it is, uh, send it to us. Yeah. And just so we can put this into context, I, I want to point out something. Jeff and I are not second generation church God. Neither of us were raised in the church. We are considered first generation. Yeah. Nancy is second generation. Right. She was raised in the church by church, right. church parents. Mm -hmm. And this is a distinction that's important as we come when we come into the church because we all have different viewpoints. And even between me and Jeff, we're different as first generation. Yeah. My beginnings in the church of God go all the way back to worldwide of the early 70s. Jeff's beginnings in the Church of God are in CGI in the 90s, I believe. Isn't that correct? Yeah. That's yeah. Right. So even among... A lot different. A lot <laughs> different perspective. So even among just three of us sitting in, the, in this one desk together, we have totally different perspectives on the church and our roles in it. 
So let's read very quickly some of what this writer says. Jeff, why don't you start? All right, so this is what they wrote on here. Uh, they, they say, one of the biggest concerns for our church today is an aging ministry. Uh, the older generations are asking themselves, who's going to take over the work of the church when we're gone? Not only does there seem to be a lack of interest in the type of career by our young people, but there's a constant stream of them leaving the church altogether. First and second generation Christians will be followed by this, wondering what it is that the younger generations aren't getting. So that, and that, and that's the first thing they make a uh, point of. And I, I would make a point. I think I'm the uh, youngest ministry in our church <laughs> that I know of. Uh -huh. I'm always younger and I'm pretty, you know, getting, up, getting up there. So we definitely need, if there's young people out there, we need them to you know, be involved. Absolutely. And so to sort of give them some points why they're not involved and why they're not, not seeking this as a life. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the first point they make says when you're given something, it's not easy to appreciate it. So in the 30s, people from all, the, all over were overwhelmed with excitement by the truth. It was unlike anything they had ever heard before. And it stirred up a passion of learning. Many faced difficult obstacles in order to start following their newfound faith, including losing relationships with family and friends. But their faith was the most precious thing to them. It was worth whatever else they had to give up in order to follow God. And so many of these first generations brought the children with them, and their lives, uh, the second generation, took on a drastic change. They said goodbye to Christmas and parties on Friday nights, and even the Sabbath holy days, and they saw firsthand the difference it made in their lives. So most of us third and fourth generation Christians were born in church, never knowing anything different. And so I guess, that, so he's saying they never had to have a struggle about mm -hmm. keeping Christmas or giving up those memories because mm -hmm. <laughs> never knew anything about it. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I, I cannot understand that because I, you know, I came away from that. Uh, attending every church every Saturday was just what we did. Right. And just like some people, they, you know, it, it was you know, raised or raised. It was part of being as much as eating dinner was. But, and when we're told to have a fire and passion about God's truth, a thirst for knowledge. He said, but it's not easy, so easy to be thirsty when you've never been without water. Good just, point. Just as you appreciate a bike, you worked all summer to buy more than one is given to you. We struggle appreciating the faith that was given to us. The fact that many of us struggle with our passion for God and his way of life can make us feel guilty. We question why we don't have the intense love for the truth that those did before us. And it makes us wonder if there's something wrong with us. We look at these ministers and elders that stand before us and seem so perfect. I don't, I don't know. But they're not. I don't know any ministry elders are perfect. And we think we'll ne I'll never measure up. So if you're a young person watching, you can measure up. And when we worry that there's, there's something wrong with us because of our lack of zeal, we get discouraged. Mm -hmm. Convince ourselves that God isn't all that interested in us, and it becomes easier to leave. So that's, that's an opinion uh, okay. from, from this writer here. All right. And uh, Nancy, what's the next point this writer makes? Okay, the next point is we ache for more meaningful ways to serve. And uh, the writer says, we have a deep need to be part of a team. And this is something you hear a lot about when millennials saying they like to work together as a team and be a part of a team. They want to be appreciated for their gifts and talents. Um, but they, they feel like uh, the church can be too strict or certain ones and with the guidelines of what's appro appropriate. Um, other churches, they go on to say, other churches have mission trips, praise bands, and artisan groups that help give those with more creative gifts a place to serve. Um, they said, uh, sometimes I think we start to confuse tradition with core beliefs, and I would agree, sometimes we can. Our traditions are things that we as human beings put into place, like the order of services, or what types of hymns we sing, and what we talk about. But core beliefs are things that God put into place, absolutely true, like the Sabbath and holy days. Mm -hmm. Core beliefs should never change, but there does come a time to change tradition. And wraps up with saying, when we can't find our place, when we feel our talents aren't wanted, we feel uh, squashed creatively, it becomes easier to leave. So um, what I hear this person saying is, we want to help. We want to serve. We want to make a difference. And I say, praise God. Yeah. I'd like to add that all too often I see among older Christians uh, and a willingness to just come to church and be fed. That's all, you know, and then go home. If you have, you know, if you have a food drive, they'll bring a can or two. If you set up an opportunity to serve outside of the service, you know, you're going to find they're too busy, live too far away, they're too tired, mm -hmm. um, they don't have transportation, whatever. So what I want to ask this young person and all you young people out there, if there are any of you, um, how would you like to serve? Would you like to organize a sandwich project? Um, to, to give sandwiches or sack lunches to a homeless shelter. Do you want to teach Sabbath school? Uh, we need Sabbath school teachers. Do you want to work on social media? We can use that. Jeff could use some support. Tech help at church? We could use that too. 
At Tyler CGI, we could use your help and we will put you to work. We already have first and second generation Christians who are willing to hand out the songbooks and announcements and bring food for potluck. We don't need that. No. We don't need to assign you that. Nope. Would you like to learn to lead songs? Even young ladies should learn because I cannot tell you how many times I've been at a women's conference and not a single one of us knows how to lead songs. So we're stuck um, with no song leader. Uh, plus, I've been to a couple of CGI congregations that have female song leaders. So uh, you can be put to work if that's something that, that speaks to you. So write us. Write us in the chat room. Write us an email at wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. Text us, do whatever, and let us know what speaks to you. Where do you feel your talents lie? Give us a chance to put you to work right here at CGI. Preaching the gospel, feeding the flock, helping the poor. These are the big three that the church is told to do, and it doesn't get more meaningful than that. Well, I'd like to add something to that. Uh, we do have something that's been actually somewhat successful in the CGI, and that's our Infuse program. Mm -hmm. And so the Infuse program was put together uh, over 10, 11 years ago. It was um, Mike James and Noni McVeigh. They actually saw this problem <laughs> 10 years ago. And what it was in the Feast of Tabernacles, we were having services at the feast. It was in Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. and there was a, all the young people were kind of sitting outside the services, mm -hmm. and they were just like sitting around talking. They weren't interested in what was going on inside. And I said, "Well, we got to do something about this because these people, this is the future of the church, and they're they seem to show no interest." And, and what Infuse is, it has, there's a magazine, there's events, there's Feast of Tabernacles, and I have personally seen young people who are still a part of Infuse who have been, you know worked on the magazine, worked on the service projects, worked on the Feast of who are still part of the church, mm -hmm. who are growing. And, and when I look at the future leaders of, of CGI, I do see there's some out there, and most all of them are part of this, this thing that we've put together so that there is opportunity for young people. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of these younger people are getting older, and now they're looking for younger people to kind of step in and help them out with Infuse. So another opportunity to help in CGI is find these Infuse and see what they're doing. They're doing great things right now and see how you can help them and be a part of that because it's really, it's all about service and getting involved. And, with it. and one more point about that is uh, about CGI. We look for ways to work with other congregations. We're part of the Winter Family Weekend. Um, we have a joint feast with CEM. We do the Common Faith Network Feast. And we're not like a lot of other congregations. We realize we're small and we need help. So if you want to, if you go to another independent congregation or one of those mega brands and you want to come here once a year and you never tie to this 501c3, we don't care. Yeah. Come over, help, help in the tech room, help us with blogs, help us with articles for Infuse or yeah. even poetry. I've seen poetry in there or, you know, um, uh, cartoons. Yeah. Just whatever you want to do. And if you can write yeah. a kid's class, we love you. Write one. Send it to us. <laughs> yeah, the, the writer brings up a good point. She says, I think this is a female. I don't know why I think that. Someone told me that. The person, whoever it is, says we should never compromise on doctrines. Absolutely. But I have grown weary over the years dealing with people who are obstructionist when it comes to things like music and mission trips and activities and methods of evangelism because people say this is too Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if it's, if you can't find anything in scripture against it, it's not Protestantism. <laughs> it's, it's just a method to use to preach the gospel and yeah. feed the flock. Right. So we're on your side on this stuff. We really, really are mm -hmm. here on BOT. So uh, talk to us, share your stories. And um, we're about out of time, so we can't, we're going to continue this discussion next week on reaching young people and uh, we have some more points. We've we got some more points. We got this is going to go on for weeks. So uh, let's see. Do we have anything else? Have you made any comments about this or yeah, anything in the chat room? Um, there, there's some talk about uh, comparing, you know, like trying to find somebody when you're single now and how tough it is. So and that, <laughs> Tell me. that there used to be a lot more activities, and that's true. When we when our church. Uh, organizations were bigger in worldwide. That was one thing they could do. They could have these big, big groups. Mm -hmm. But if others will follow the example of getting past the, you know, you can only date people in this tiny little niche, mm -hmm. and you can only do things with just these few people in your group, or, or you know, if they will get over that, then then God, you know, it'll be easier for God to bless you with a with a mate. You know, easier to you to find one and stuff. All right, next Friday night, I'm going to ask the question, does the church of God need a paradigm shift? That's a real pivotal question. And I've yeah. got, and I say the answer is yes. 
and I'm going to go into details about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ruffle some feathers. I'm going to be goring some sacred cows. I think you guys have read my uh, thing I wrote up on mm -hmm. the, the Need for Paradigm show. I'll read it again to make sure I'm fresh. Yeah. But uh, it's, it, I think it's going to have some things in there that are going to be controversial. But we've got to deal with these issues because we're losing too many young people. We need a paradigm mm -hmm. shift. Okay. We welcome your emails. Welcome your chat room comments. We'll be right back after this break. Nothing is surer than death and taxes. Millions of people pay taxes every day, and millions of people die every day. We have all lost loved ones through death. Death is a dreaded enemy. Death is not a friend. Many people have great fear when they think about their own deaths and deaths of others who are close to them. What happens when you die? Do you have an immortal soul that either goes up to heaven or down to an ever-burning hell after you die? It's time you learn the answers to these questions. We can help you. We have a booklet called Afraid to Die. You can get it on our website at cgi.org. It's free. Again, that's Afraid to Die at cgi.org. Please come back and see us next Friday evening at 7.30 p.m. Central Time right here on CGI.org or watch us on Roku. Uh, in the meantime, have a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Wow.